Uh, Senator Cardin and Senator Portman, who are, have just joined us, have uh, not only been champions of these issues of savings and ownership over the last decades, but their names are completely synonymous, you can do it on Wikipedia, with the major tax bills that were a huge leap forward for our country on encouraging Americans to save for retirement. And we have brought them back together uh, in this new decade, uh, when we need more than ever as boomers age, as the transition from traditional pensions to divine contribution pensions continues, and Americans see their financial security very much tied to retirement savings. This, we need you again, Senators <laughs> Portman and Cardin. And so, uh, as many of you know, uh, the talk is high on what we need going forward. There was a hearing this week on, uh, on the tax-favored retirement system. There'll be a release next week of the Social Security's Trust Report. And it's really a perfect time to think about regaining momentum and focusing on what's next in retirement savings policy. Uh, so today we're doing this event in conjunction with the National Retirement Planning Week. And I'm going to turn to Lee Covington, who's the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of the Insured Retirement Institute, to say your official welcome. Great. Thank you, Lisa. It's been a real pleasure to partner with uh, the Aspen Institute and you again on this event uh, this year. And on behalf of IRI, I want to uh, thank you for your continued support of National uh, Retirement Planning Week. I also want to thank several uh, National Retirement Planning Week coalition members who are in the room today and who are participating uh, in this discussion, including two IRI board member companies, LPL Financial and Prudential Financial. Uh, Lisa, I also want to extend our gratitude uh, to the Aspen Institute for your continual efforts uh, to elevate the dialogue about the imminent need uh, for all Americans to prepare for and to save for their retirement uh, years, which will extend 30 years uh, or more for the majority of households in America. I think people are taken back by that number when they hear that number. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, in just a moment we'll be hearing from two of our nation's leaders on this very topic, uh, and it's a particular treat for me to have with us Senator Rob Portman for, from Ohio, where I served as the state's insurance commissioner for four years, and we were also law partners for a brief time before I joined RRI, and he ran for the Senate. I just can't help myself to name drop, so uh, I apologize uh, for that. Any good government relations guy would do so. So both of these uh, men have uh, long been champions for helping Americans build retirement security. Uh, we applaud both of you for your dedication to these uh, issues. You know, all of us here certainly know that it, how very real uh, the retirement savings crisis is in America. And according to research that RRI released last week, uh, boomers uh, who are nearing or entering retirement know it too. Uh, that research found that few boomers are optimistic about uh, their financial situation uh, in the next five years. 62% believe that it will be about the same or it will deteriorate during that time period. Unfortunately, this confidence uh, shortage is highest among uh, middle uh, income and single boomers who, as we know, will have an even greater challenge uh, meeting these needs. So that's the crux of what we're tr trying to achieve through uh, National Retirement uh, Planning Week to raise awareness about the steps consumers can take uh, to assure their uh, greater retirement security. And I know that that will be the theme of each person's topic uh, today. So thank uh, all of you who are in the room uh, today for uh, your time, your talents, and your efforts to uh, help us overcome the retirement income challenges in America. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lee, very much. And Lee, if you leave with my remarks, I will uh, <laughs> <laughs> blow the, the introductions program. here. So. <laughs> uh, I, I, I get to say the line, the people who need no introduction are our senators, Senator Cardin and Senator Portman. Uh, Senator Cardin, since coming to Congress in 1987, has been a national leader on retirement security. Uh, he was first elected to the Senate in 2006 and currently serves on the Finance, Budget, Foreign Relations, Environment, Public Works, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee. So welcome, Senator Cardin. Senator Portman was sworn into the Senate in January 2011 after serving 12 years in the House. Uh, as former director of the Office of Management and Budget, Senator Portman proposed a balanced budget, fought irresponsible earmarks, and put in place transparency for all federal spending. And not surprisingly, Senator Portman is now on the Budget Committee, along with uh, Senator Cardin, and as well as the Armed Service Energy and Natural Resource Committee. So we are very happy to bring the Portman-Cardin duo back together again to launch this event. 
Joining us, we also have an amazing panel. Uh, we have uh, next to Senator Portman, Chris Marks, the president of Prudential Retirement. Uh, we have next to Chris, uh, Christina Martin Vervita, the director of economic security at AARP. We have next to Christina uh, Belchetney, who's the executive vice president of LPL Financial Retirement Partners. And next to Bill, we have Jeff Cruz, the executive director of Latinos for a Secure Retirement. Going down to the other end, to Karen Alinsky, the general counsel of uh, TIAA CREF. And finally, Janice Gregory, president of the National Academy of Social Insurance. This room knows you've got the best panel for this issue of regaining momentum in all of Washington, and you have the best senators. And my job is to turn this over to you, Senator Cardin. And um, you can come up. Uh, we're going to bring you back down. We're going to chat a little bit. Uh, our format today is to have each of the senators make a few remarks and then a few questions. So welcome. Thank you. Well, Lisa, thank you very much. Let me thank uh, Lisa Mensa for uh, bringing us together and, and Aspen Institute for having this very, very important program on retirement savings and national savings. And it's great to be here with Senator Portman. Um, as you know, uh, for a long time, uh, he represented my first name. <laughs> and um, it, it was a pleasure to work with him in the House of Representatives during some times when it was very, very difficult for Democrats and Republicans to work together. I know you don't remember those days. <laughs> uh, but we had to find a, a sort of a quiet spot where no one would see us when we, we used to meet uh, to go over legislation. And I'm not even joking about that. And we worked together in a very, very bipartisan manner. So many of you have heard of the Portman Cardin efforts. And it's not really about two you know, uh, members of the House of Representatives at the time. It was a process. And there are many people in this room who were part of that process, who agreed to sit around a table and, yes, present their views, but also to listen. And the only thing we asked of all the stakeholders, at the end of the day, let's come together. Listen to everyone. Let's figure out what we can get done. Because we had identified a problem, a serious problem for America, that we weren't saving enough as a nation. Now, remember, this was during the time when our economy was really booming. This was a, uh, 11 years ago. And our economy was doing extremely well. People were happy, spending money, but we're not saving. We're not saving. And we were told over and over again by the naysayers, you don't have to be concerned about that because people are saving in the equities of their homes. Well, we know what happened to that. And Congressman then Portman, said, look, we've got to do something about that. And he asked me to help. I tell you, it wasn't the first thing that Rob asked me to help on. I'll never forget when he said, uh, we have this IRS reform that will make the IRS more <laughs> efficient in collecting taxes for my constituents. I need a Democrat to walk the plank on it. Would you do it? And it was the right thing to do. And, uh, and Rob really deserves a great deal of credit for taking on that challenge. But for Congressman Portman, that would not have gotten done, and it was a huge uh, improvement and modernization of the IRS. So I, I'm, a, I'm a big Rob Portman fan on the issues he gets involved in. He wants results. Uh, he has his strong views, but he knows at the end of the day we have to reach an agreement and get things moving for this country. And uh, he's just the person we need, I think, in the United States Senate today to help us bridge uh, the, the, the partisan divide. Now, what we were able to accomplish a decade ago was to recognize the three-legged stool of, uh, of retirement security. And that is, yes, we want to make sure Social Security is strong, but we also need to have private savings and private retirement options. We were faced with the realities that the retirement world was changing, that whereas most people several decades ago could rely upon their employer having a defined benefit plan where the risks of, uh, of market performance or outliving your retirement was not there. Uh, today's world was changing to a defined contribution world. And we had to recognize that and we wanted to do something to increase retirement security. And at the end of the day, we were successful. We were successful in pointing out that individuals are unlikely to save enough for their retirement just based upon the tax 
deferral issue. That's a reality. We like to think tax deferral is enough, but it was not enough. We needed employers to offer a convenient way for individuals to be able to save for their retirement. And if the company would put money on the table, then it was very likely that people would participate. But for smaller companies, was it worth all the aggravation to set up a retirement plan? So we worked at ways to make it simpler for smaller companies to set up retirement plans. We increased the limits, and we did that for two reasons. One, more money was going to be put away for retirement, the higher the limit. That's a fact. You're going to get more money into savings. That's good. Secondly, it has to be worthwhile for the people putting together the plan to, to set up a plan. And the limits are so low that they do the math and say, gee, it's just not worth the, the aggravation. They're not going to set up a plan. So for all those reasons, we wanted to make it easier, and we were successful in increasing the limits. And then we also wanted to, to make it uh, easier for, for lower wage workers. And if the company didn't set up a plan, we set up a government incentive, a savers credit, to make it easier for companies or for individuals to to say, look, there's money on the table. I don't want to lose this money. And it worked. We got more people involved in retirement savings. We also wanted to preserve assets. And I sort of call this the, 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 the Deborah Carden rule. Deborah's my daughter, in case you don't know who Deborah is. Deborah, by the time she was 23, had worked in six different companies and had four different retirement plans, none of which were compatible. And she would have withdrawn that money for sure if it weren't for her father telling her she couldn't <laughs> withdraw that money. So we, we developed portability. An ability where you could really combine the different retirement plans and be able to preserve your assets. And we had the catch-up contribution, which we thought made a lot of sense. By the time you reach, uh, when, when you're young, you should put money away for retirement, but you're more focused on buying a home or more focused on putting your children through college. And by the time you can get around to save, <coughs> you think you can, and you're in your 50s, it, you don't have a lot more years in order to achieve your, your, your goal. So the catch-up contribution was, uh, was uh, brought forward, and, and that's what helped people to be able to reach their goal uh, for, for retirement. We recognize that many people make decisions by inaction. So the automatic enrollment feature was something that really worked well and uh, would uh, allow a lot of people who really wanted to but just never got around to checking the box uh, into uh, retirement plans. But it also had another major advantage in that the uh, the uh, investment options on a default plan were better suited to the individual based upon that person's age than an individual's own selections. So we found that default options actually worked fairly well and helped us in, in getting people into the right type of plans. Uh, and then we worked very hard on financial literacy. <coughs> this is an issue that we feel very passionately about, that people need to know, have a better understanding uh, as to what it means uh, to save for, the, for their future. Uh, we, we didn't give up on defined benefit plans. We tried to preserve them the best that we could. And I think we've been successful in keeping uh, pres uh, plans. And we wanted to make sure that we did all of the above, that we wanted to, this to, to work in, in, for, for all individuals. We said at the time that this was not the end of our, of our efforts that we knew that we were going to have to come back to this, which brings us to 2012. And let me tell you, 2012 is a tough year to talk about additional incentives for savings. When we're trying to get the economy back on track, and all economists tell us we've got to spend more in order to get the economy back on track. We recognize that. That's why there hasn't been a real effort to, in this Congress to say, oh, we need a huge new program for people to save money. We do. We need it in 2012. It's just not going to pass in 2012. So our primary effort right now is to be responsible on the federal budget, to get us back to a sensible budget. And Senator Portman and I are going to agree on this point. Our current budget's not sustainable. We have to have a plan that brings our budget into better balance. It's got to be a responsible plan. It's got to be a credible plan. I would add it has to be bipartisan. And I would add it has to be balanced. And we need to do that sooner rather than later. But in this process, let's not lose the progress we've already made on uh, private savings and retirement. And I pointed out, and I will continue to point out at all the Senate finance hearings that are held on this subject, that to change the incentives we currently have on deferral of income for retirement is not real revenue. 
Oh, this is a timing issue. It does nothing to, to deal with the long-term fiscal problems of America. So it's, it's not a responsible way to look at revenue because it only is a timing issue. So we're going to do everything we can as we get into these discussions about tax reform, and I'll be glad to go over different points on that, to preserve what we have now. Can we strengthen it? Yes. Can we substitute for something better? Yes. But just to eliminate, no. And, and that's going to be our, our strong position, and I've made that clear, again, in all the Senate finance hearings. And we're looking for opportunities to advance um, what we, uh, areas that we see real weakness. I will tell you one that I do. We need more annuitant retirement. We need to have more opportunities for people not to outlive their assets. I'll never forget the hearing we had in the Ways and Means Committee. It was a cabinet secretary who was testifying, talking about his parents, who were very successful business people. And when they retired in their early 60s, they sold their business, took the money out, and took out a, 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 their own plan that they would spend that over the next 20 years and have lived happily ever after. Well, they were in their mid-80s very healthy with no money. We need annuitant retirement protection. Other than Social Security, the defined benefit world is, is eroding. We need to be able to substitute that with incentives for people to supplement <coughs> for annuitant retirement. And we're looking for ways. We need to improve the savers credit because low wage workers still find it difficult to save. We've got to expand the default system. I, I, I'm a big fan in, in getting people into the program. They want to opt out fine. Well, let's use uh, inaction to get more people enrolled. We are looking at universal plans. I think that makes sense not to replace the current available savings options, including Social Security, but to supplement. And we do think there's ways of doing it, particularly for people who don't have retirement options provided uh, by uh, their employers. We certainly are looking for simplifying retirement options, particularly on multi-employer plans, so that small companies can, in fact, participate in larger plans. I think that all that makes, makes sense. And we really want to concentrate on literacy. Uh, we've made progress. I've gone to a lot of schools where they do have financial literacy as part of their programming. I know in the state of Maryland, we've taken state action to include financial literacy in our curriculums in, in our state. We need to do that around the nation. We need to have better opportunities within companies to provide <coughs> literacy to their employees to make the right type of decisions. And I, am, I think it's important, most and for all, the most important thing we need to do is get back to the type of process that Portman Carden was all about. And that's a process where we, we're free, we have free discussions in which we work with a spirit to get a result and we're willing to listen and compromise and come out with a bipartisan product that's responsible, that makes sense, and continues us along the process to achieve the results of more savings here in America to strengthen our economy. When I come to a session like this under the Aspen Institute, it gives me great confidence that, that in fact we will achieve that objective. And I thank you all very much for participating. Great. Well, I thought Ben did a, did a great job talking about uh, what we tried to do and what needs to be done. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having us again. We were here in 2004. So, you know, every eight years or so we need to meet like this. Um, Lee, we want you back in the Buckeye State, so don't, don't get too comfortable here in Washington. And uh, Lisa, thank you. I love Lisa's name, Mensa. Um, she's bright, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. She's a Mensa. Um, and uh, it, it is critical, as Ben said, that we talk about, you know, what, what succeeded and, and the kind of model that can be used going forward. And I, I do think it's, uh, it's interesting that we find ourselves in another very partisan period of time, and yet we have these huge problems. And this is, this is I think, a, a good model to look at going forward, not just for retirement savings, but for so many other challenges. And it's been great working with, with Ben. Uh, he mentioned the fact that we had to meet quietly behind closed doors now and again because of the fear of our colleagues finding out we were meeting. And, trying to curtail our efforts. The fact is, uh, Ben took a lot of heat back then. And uh, he showed some political courage at a time when uh, some in his party were trying to get him to, to go a different way. And sometimes, uh, you know, I took a little of that too, but frankly not as much as Ben. So uh, 
for those of you in the room who supported our efforts in and supported Ben, I hope you you will remember that. And um, as he talked about, I think you know we we fundamentally agree on where we ought to be going forward. And so as this process gets going again, we're going to have detractors on both sides again, and folks who are going to be looking at different approaches sometimes that seem more politically uh, attractive. And uh, appreciate your, your your sticking with us. Uh, Earl Pomeroy, who I don't see here today, but who's very involved in this issue still in the private sector, used to say that Ben Cardin and Rob Portman were a team. And as you may remember, he used to specifically say we were like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. <laughs> the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers of retirement savings, uh, which means I did everything Ben did. I just did it backwards and with high heels on. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think you were Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, th I think it was a good, good legislative process. Uh, one of the things we did was, was, you know, we did look at the politics as well as the substance. And the politics meant bringing people together so that we get something done. And so we had the AFL-CIO involved, um, and we had the Chamber of Commerce involved. And so many of you who are here today, um, so many groups kind of in between. And we were able to get everybody to agree that although they weren't going to get everything they wanted, that at the end of the day, everybody was going to have a better retirement system. And, and uh, again, that's a, that's a good model going forward. We got it in the 2001 tax bill, which people don't remember. It, it was not in the 2001 proposal as it came from right. the Bush administration. And that was quite a fight. Many of you helped on that. Uh, and at the time, people were saying, uh, kind of like they're saying now, gee, it's not a time to focus on savings. It's a time to focus on you know, more spending and more consumption because at that time we were coming out of the 2001 recession. And we kept making the point that ultimately our economic growth is going to be dependent upon savings and investment and that with less than half of the workforce at that time as we looked at it in the private sector side and, and plans, we needed to be sure that people had more savings for their retirement as baby boomers were beginning to retire. Um, all that's true. All that's true today. Ben talked about what the legislation did, so I won't go into that, but let me just talk about some of the results of it. Since 2000, uh, and again, this passed in 2001, but since 2000, 401k and other defined contribution plan assets have increased by 50 percent. And that's despite the fact that we've just gone through uh, this period in which many of our assets seemed like they dropped from a 401k to a 201k uh, mm -hmm. during the recession. So these are 2010 numbers. Over that same period, savings in IRAs uh, increased by over 80 percent. U.S. retirement savings have increased from $11.7 trillion in 2000 to the number I just got today, a new number, uh, $17.9 trillion in 2011. So that's $11.7 trillion to $17.9 trillion in 2011. And again, that's despite the fact we've had, had quite a downturn in, in many particular equity investments in the interim period. Among full-time employees, we're now told 73 percent have access to a workplace plan. Now, this number kind of goes back and forth. I heard 78 percent at a Ways and Means hearing yesterday. Um, but uh, these are higher numbers uh, than they were back in, in 2000. About 6 million taxpayers now receive the Savers Credit. So Ben talked about refining that, making it work better, making it easier to access. 6 million people. Um, that's a pretty big change. The simple plan, uh, Ben didn't talk so much about that, but he talked about the fact that we've simplified. The simple plan itself now has hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of employees uh, taking advantage of it. So uh, that was a good start. Does more need to be done? Absolutely. And uh, I would just point to a couple areas, uh, some of which Ben talked about. Um, one, of course, is coverage. Among workers and small businesses, there's still not adequate coverage. So there's not even the opportunity to be covered. That goes, again, to the complexity of plans, the cost of putting together plans, some of the liability issues I'll talk about in a second. Um, adequacy, adequacy of funds, I think we'll hear some about that from our panel. You know, the notion is not just to have a 401k or an IRA, but to actually have enough money in there to be able to spread it out over uh, your lifetime. Um, leakage, being sure that uh, early withdrawals and other ways in which people are creatively using their plans doesn't make it difficult to actually build up that retirement savings. Um, and then finally, lifetime savings. Uh, ben talked a little about this, but you know, lump sum versus a lifetime savings. And Ben talked about annuitization. Um, this is a critical issue as people are living longer. Um, 
the environment is tough right now, Ben's right, um, and it's partly about the deficit and the debt and the fact that folks are looking under every rock for revenue right now. Having been a member of the super committee, which turned out to be not so super, uh, I can tell you uh, there was a lot of talk about retirement savings and the so-called tax expenditure involved with retirement savings. So it's a, it's a battle. I'm glad Ben's in the Finance Committee. I wish I was there with him. Um, but um, I understand the Ways and Means Committee hearing went really well in this regard, that there is uh, an acknowledgment of the importance of this and to uh, look at it differently in terms of tax reform. I'm a huge advocate of tax reform. I know Ben is too, but we need to be sure we're not doing so in a way that makes it more difficult for people to save, particularly the kind of savings investments for retirement that we're talking about today. Lisa mentioned that last time I was here, I talked about my family experience in this, so I'm going to mention it again, just to say that sometimes we forget that this really works. And uh, my dad, when he was in his 40s, set up his own business. He left a job as a salesman where he had a retirement plan and kind of risked it all to start a little business. He had five people. My mom was the bookkeeper. And his first day on the job, he started a profit sharing plan in 1960. He had no profit for three years, so it was kind of <laughs> kind of awkward, you know, to tell the employees, you have a profit sharing plan, but we have no profit. But when they started making money, um, that profit sharing plan kicked in, and then as soon as he could in the 70s, he, he started a 401k, <coughs> and, and the company has a profit sharing plan and a 401k. And there are guys uh, retiring this year who turned a wrench their entire career, technicians, who have four or 500,000 bucks in these accounts. And you hope they're not going to take it on a lump sum. <laughs> uh, uh, and you know, I've talked to some of them about that, and, and the company helps them with their, with their thinking on that and planning. But this works. Uh, it works to give people the peace of mind in retirement that we all seek, and we seek for our parents, our grandparents. Uh, it works to ensure that the social security safety net is there, but because it's inadequate, it can be supplemented. And it lets these people, frankly, because a lot of them do it, a lot of these guys are not using the money for themselves or a boat or a vacation. They're using it for their kids. Mm -hmm. So to pay college education for a grandchild, say. Um, so this is um, something that I know works because I grew up in it. I've experienced it. Uh, I know these people personally, and I've seen what it's done for, for their lives. 77 million of us baby boomers are set to retire. Uh, we're already retiring, so that's a change from the, the last time we met, and certainly 2000 and 2001, it's now happening. So 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day. And they're going into a frayed system, which is Social Security and Medicare. And Ben talked about the importance of those programs. Of course, they're critically important, but they're also in deep financial trouble. Uh, they're spending more than they're taking in. I mean, that's the basic problem. And people would say Social Security's in great shape, uh, spending more in benefits than is taken in in payroll taxes. That's not good. <laughs> and that's where you get these trillion dollar liabilities racked up over, over time. So we've got to deal with those programs and reform them, in part because it's the right thing to do to be sure that safety net is there, in part because if we don't, it crowds out everything else, including discretionary spending and including private retirement savings over time, because there won't be any money left for you know, not just the discretionary spending that we all think is important, including defense and research and education, but also for some of these so-called tax expenditures. So it's critical we do that, and it's related, related to our work to be able to ensure those incentives for private savings are still there. On auto enrollment, um, I agree it's been one of the great successes. Uh, I talk to businesses about it all the time. I've been to over 120 plant tours in the last three years, and I always ask, of course, about the retirement plan. They're always surprised. I know as much about it as I do and <laughs> kind of confused. Why is this guy asking all these questions about how much we contribute and how much our match is and what percentage and so on. But um, the fact is the average participation rate is about 75%. We've got some experts here who can correct me on the latest data. Uh, if you have auto enrollment, it's about 90%. Some companies, 95%. So it's a big difference. And, and that results in so many people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to save having some savings they're building up. Now, um, we need to do more in terms of not just getting people to save, but save an adequate amount for the retirement. And this goes to the auto escalation issue that some of you have worked on. Um, I think there need to be safe harbor rules there. 
Is 10 percent enough? It's a good question. And by the way, this matters not just to those who choose not to make a decision and therefore um, are opted into the program, but it also matters to the employees who choose to opt in and are looking for what the standard is. And there's a new study out on this, some of you may have seen, indicating that employees look and say, okay, well, if the escalation is 10 percent, maybe that's where I ought to be. Uh, maybe that's not high enough. So I think this is a bigger issue than just being sure that those who are in auto enrollment um, have adequate savings. <coughs> Life expectancy has been talked about. I won't go into detail on that except to say that we need to remove barriers that impede retirees from continuing to work as well as working on the annuitization issue, in my view. If folks want to continue working and are able to, uh, we need to be sure that we aren't discouraging that, again, with so many baby boomers living longer, healthier lives. And of course, not just incentives, but also protections need to be in place in order for auto enrollment and auto escalation to work, because we want more employers to use it, and we want to give them the assurances that they're not going to run into legal problems. Uh, one of the issues I've been engaged with in the last year that some of you have worked on is this regulation that's now still percolating at the Department of Labor, having to do with uh, redefining what it means to give fiduciary advice. I think this directly relates to what we're talking about. Um, the concern on auto escalation and auto enrollment is more the small business owner, but the same issue really is addressed here, which is, you know, what kind of rules are we going to have in place and are people going to be concerned about getting engaged and, and involved in this. In his proposed form, the regulation expanded the de definition of fiduciary in a way that I believe really would have created a risk to a lot of employees who get advice right now, particularly middle income, lower income employees. Um, there's a study that shows that the regulation could have caused 7.2 million IRA holders, for instance, to lose access to an investment professional as firms would change their business practices, because I believe that they, they would to avoid the litigation exposure um, that followed from fiduciary status. So my concern is obviously this would result in higher costs and um, higher account minimums and lower participation. And again, particularly true for middle income savers and lower income savers. Some of them can't afford a formal investment advisor, of course, and so they rely on um, free and occasionally um, they get investment information from professionals at places uh, like Ameriprise. I don't see them here, but Charles Schwab and others. We want to be sure they get that without triggering this fiduciary relationship. Um, I, I got engaged to the point that I wrote Jack Lou, who was in, then at OMB, to say, oh, I ought to look at this because, you know, he's responsible for making sure that the, the right analysis is done of regulations. And um, so we'll see what happens. As you know, DOL has pulled back, but they have also said that they've simply postponed it and they plan to move forward after the first of the year. So I hope you all will continue to monitor that and be involved with it. I certainly will. Uh, I think we can all agree that we need to protect investors and we need to protect their assets. And I think we can all agree that the longstanding regulations in place should be reviewed and updated periodically. I have no problem with that. But we've got to be careful about this. And we need to do it deliberately to ensure we're not going to have unintended results. And in this case, uh, I think we would have restricted the availability of investment help to some of those who, who need it most. So we have lots to do together. We've got to get back on the dance floor. Um, and work on these critical issues and do so as we did back in the 2000-2001 period during what's going to be, um, you know, a partisan period. And uh, that doesn't mean we, we can't get it done. Uh, we've done it before and we need to do it again. Thank you all. Okay. Since uh, I know you can't stay for everybody, but I, I took the liberty of, of talking to all the panelists beforehand, and I asked them to give me one word that would capture their sense of where we needed to generate momentum. And so I'm going to give you the words, and then I'd like your reaction. So uh, Christine Marks of Prudential picked longevity. Christina Martin for Vita picked uh, ARP, picked adequacy. Bill Chetney of LPL picked advice. Jeff Cruz of Latinos for a Secure Retirement picked inclusivity. Karen Alinsky of TIA Craft picked lifetime income. And Janice Gregory of the National Academy of Social Insurance picked bedrock. And in many ways, these words, longevity, adequacy, advice, inclusivity, lifetime income, and bedrock, 
really get at what uh, you've mentioned them all in your remarks, but they get at the unfinished agenda. Uh, and I think what the question that is hanging for us, and I'm, I'm so glad that both of you gave speeches that, that gave us some hope. Senator Portman, things work. Senator Cardin, we can work. <laughs> Those were very positives. But if you think about some of these words, Give us a sense from your view of how far we can get. And you can pick your favorite one. I'll, I'll start with one, and I'm, I'm going to start with Jeff's, because I think it often gets left out, of inclusivity. Can everyone in America have an account? And can the tax system support everybody to build up a nest egg? Well, Lisa, thank you. Uh, I think that all the terms work well together. I, I was just listening to them all. I think we, Rob and I touched upon just about every one. Uh, the answer is, I hope so. Um, we, we might have a little bit of a disagreement here. We're all watching very carefully what the Supreme Court does in June. And uh, I mention that because I want to see the parameters in which Congress can operate. Sure, the Congress in the 1930s, when it passed Social Security, was wondering whether it was going on down a path that would, could be uh, constitutionally sustained, requiring people to buy annuities and disability policies. And then in the 1960s, where we required people to have our seniors and disabled to go into a health care system. And of course, in the last year, two years ago, where we required people to buy health insurance. I mention that because it may not directly answer your question when you say inclusivity. It was, will everybody be included in a security, uh, uh, in financial security? It depends on how far you want to take the governmental role. How far do you want to take it? Uh, I've talked to the Chamber of Commerce and AFL-CIO, and both seem inclined to say that maybe we should have some form of universal savings availability in this, in this country. And maybe it should be a required plan that everybody has to participate in some type of required savings uh, outside of Social Security. We understand uh, we're not going to go down that road because it's not going to lead to a successful result. Uh, maybe we can do that. Maybe we can structure ways in which we can offer universal opportunities to everyone in our country that's in the workforce. But uh, these are uh, options that may very well have to wait upon not just the Supreme Court in June, but also wait upon the climate that Senator Portman talked about. It's not just the budget problem, which is real and has to be addressed, but it's the partisan division and the working relationships that also have to be mended in this country for us to deal with it. But I do think we are looking for that balance where individuals must take responsibility for their future. No one, I'm not going to suggest that government's going to solve this problem. I don't think we can solve it. But can we set up the climate in which every American has a real opportunity to save enough for uh, their future financial needs? I think the answer is yes. Uh, we're not there yet. I think there's a lot of things that we've talked about here that could achieve that. Now, before I turn it over to Senator Portman, I didn't see Dave Goshkarian when I gave my opening remarks. I don't know whether he was just late getting here or whether he was here the whole time. But he's lost so much weight, I, it's hard for me to, to, to find him in the corner. But I, I can't let the, the opportunity go without expressing my personal appreciation to the work that David and Barbara Pate did uh, uh, over a decade ago and, and really uh, keeping this process on track and, and making it a reality. I think Kashgarian was hoping you'd be done by the time he got here, so <laughs> gosh, man. And Barbara didn't even show up. Uh, is she here? No. But uh, absolutely, Barbara Pate uh, was my legislative director at the time, and she and Dave uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting to get us through the process we talked about. As usual, Janice came up with the most interesting one, bedrock. I have no idea what that means, but it must be important <laughs> if she, she suggested it. Uh, but no, I, I, I agree uh, that all these are important, longevity, adequacy, advice, certainly inclusivity, lifetime income. One thing I, I, I will say is with regard to all of them, including in inclusivity, and because it came from you, Jeff, you know, you think about all the Hispanic small business owners out there who are disproportionately benefiting from any way we can simplify 
uh, and reduce liability and reduce costs to them. And, um, you know, this is, I, I think, still, it's a challenge that we tried to address in 2001. We made progress, but still when you look at who doesn't have a bedrock or um, a private sector um, complement to Social Security, it tends to be workers and small businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, disproportionately African American or Hispanic businesses, uh, women-owned businesses, because there tend to be more small businesses there. And that's a, it's honestly, it's a, cha it's a challenge. You want to have these protections in place we talked about earlier, but you also want to be sure that these people who are making the decision, which tends to be the owner in these businesses, uh, really feel like they have the ability to offer something they want to offer to their employees without getting into a whole lot of advice from professionals, some of whom are here in the room, God bless you, but you know, they don't want to pay you. Um, and they don't want to have the potential uh, liability uh, that comes with getting into some of these plans because of the fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, they don't want to go through the testing in ways that puts them at risk. They want to have some safe harbors. And uh, if you talk to these folks, as many of you do, they want to offer these plans, but they just either can't afford it or can't see themselves going through the potential risks and, and, and liabilities. And they don't have people in-house to do this for them. So that's the challenge, I think, still. That's why the simple plans are good, even though, as I said earlier, there are lots of people who benefited from it, but frankly, people aren't saving enough. So that's why I think what the next level has to include is how do we take the small business incentives and increase them even more and then create fewer obstacles and burdens to the people who are actually making the decisions in the real world. And um, that's going to tend to be small business owners at the same time propping up, uh, of course, the larger businesses and the uh, DB plans and others that do provide uh, an, an important part of that bedrock. But I think, Lisa, that continues to be our single biggest challenge. Thank you. Bringing in the small businesses, bringing in everybody. Uh, it's really, I, am, I know your staffs are going to hate me if I do anymore, so I am going to have to say thank you. I would love, you're in the room where we could keep going until they send us out of the Capitol Visitors Center, but we are just really thankful that you came. You've inspired us to regain momentum. You've inspired us that it will be possible. I like your hope. I like your sense of where we've been in the decade, and I'm excited about the next decade and your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> In addition to their one words, we are going to let them finish full sentences. So I'm going to ask Chris Marks of Prudential to make a few remarks. And uh, if you haven't grabbed your sandwich, grab it. And we're going to do, uh, we're going to have paired remarks. So Chris Marks and then Christina, you should come up, Chris. So I thought that was fabulous. Uh, honestly, these. Uh, these senators have been leaders in this arena. They've had such a huge impact, and it's wonderful to hear the intent to continue to focus on this. I, I've been in the business for over 20 years, and for the last 10 years, I've had the benefit of seeing the impact of some of the changes that were enacted under their leadership. Um, I mean, as many of you know, we've got 10,000 uh, Americans hitting that golden age of 65 every day. We have defined benefit plans that are uh, no longer accessible um, the way they, they were historically. And so the dialogue is, is, is very vibrant in the circles in which I travel around how we continue to tackle this challenge of retirement security. And the business that I lead at Prudential, I think of as really being a window into the needs and the expectations of both employers and participants. Um, about the future of retirement security. So it's great to have a chance to talk both about the progress and, and those challenges. So it, from my standpoint, there's no question that the changes that uh, occurred uh, over the last decade have had a very positive impact in, on retirement savings generally. You know, I see the growing adoption of these auto features that, that both senators mentioned, whether it's automatic enrollment, which drives participation rates in the neighborhood of, you know, 92, 94 percent, as Senator um, Portman said. The uh, adoption of contribution escalation, that's a little less, I see that less frequently, honestly, than, than automatic enrollment, but uh, 
there's there's an impetus there that's promising. And then the impact of um, asset allocation, better diversification of risk from an investment standpoint. And these improvements would not have been possible without the provision of fiduciary safe harbors around these provisions. You know, employers really need to know that they can be more aggressive with, uh, in taking, in, in, in promoting this for their employee base because they have this um, fiduciary, fiduciary safe harbor available. Um, so, as I said, I feel like we've, we've really made some progress, but I just want to highlight a couple of areas that I think we can focus on as we regain momentum here. I'm going to focus on two areas. The first I'll call completing the program that the senators really outlined um, as they talked about the provisions of the 2001-2006 legislation. And then the second is in the coverage arena, expanding coverage to the 78 million Americans who don't have access to an employer-sponsored plan today. So completing the, the program is really about going to the next stage in terms of focusing on retirement security. Defined contribution plans have become the primary employer-sponsored vehicle for retirement savings in this country. Defined benefit plans are no longer fill that role. And I think the issue here is that defined contribution plans need to be seen not as retirement savings plans, but as retirement income plans. Because essentially, they will be fulfilling that role in addition to Social Security for millions and millions of Americans. So I talk about changing the frame, really looking at these plans in terms of what kind of income they are going to generate for individuals approaching retirement. We've had the opportunity to um, uh, develop calculators, statements, and so forth that frame the savings amount in terms of an estimated income. And it is amazing to see the change in behavior from individuals when they think about it in those terms. We've seen 20% of people who go through a calculation, a simple calculation, they'll increase their deferral rates by four percentage points. So if they were contributing 4%, they'll increase it to 8% because now they can link what they're saving with what they're going to have to live on in retirement. It's a very powerful concept that is um, about changing the frame, I'll say, around defined contribution plans. And it is part of the legislation that has been proposed around the Lifetime Income Disclosure Act. I know my colleague from T. Kreft probably shares that, that perspective too because they were an early pioneer in terms of looking at things in, in income terms. So that's one aspect of this. The other aspect of completing the program is to bring annuity-like options, in guaranteed lifetime income options into defined contribution plans and provide the safe harbor coverage that gives employers the comfort that it's okay to do that. Um, this is the, the dimension of completing the picture, bringing DB options, DB-like options uh, into plans. It allows participants to pool longevity risk uh, in a way that DB plans offered, but DC plans generally don't today. We know that the proposals that uh, Treasury has put out, the guidance they've provided recently, is an important first step in really recognizing the importance of this as a component of DC plans. But the fiduciary safe harbor status is the most Im significant impediment right now to bringing these options into ERISA plans in a much broader way. So that, that would be one ask. And then secondly, quickly, on expanding coverage, we heard a lot about small employers. The 78 million Americans that are not covered by an employer-sponsored plans, they don't, they don't have the, the benefit of payroll deduction, of institutional pricing, of fiduciary oversight. Um, this is an issue in the, in the broad arena around retirement security. I think there are proposals in the form of auto IRA proposals and multiple small employer plan proposals that can address this coverage gap. Uh, the small, multiple small employer pl plans that the senators were mentioning, I think, is an opportunity to, again, pool the purchasing power of small employers, uh, provide uh, uh, independent fiduciary to oversee administration of these plans, and really get this coverage more broadly available to uh, employees to all Americans. So with that, I will turn this back to Lisa or Christina. And thank you for the opportunity. Look forward to the discussion.
Thanks, Chris. And Christina, you should uh, just take the mic, just so the audience knows what I asked the panel to do. I asked everybody to react to our title, How Would We Regain Momentum in America's Retirement Savings Policy. So what you're hearing are priorities, and I think if you're taking notes as I am, uh, we'll just have the next uh, decades of retirement policy just framed out right in this meeting. <laughs> Chris gave us change the frame put annuity options in plans and expand <coughs> coverage. Great. So, uh, Christina, welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to uh, first acknowledge that I, I think every speaker, um, the Senators and, and Christine, have uh, referenced the 10,000 baby boomers who are retiring daily, many of whom are very lucky to have as members. And uh, we hear from a lot of them. Uh, every day in any number of ways uh, and so what I wanted to do in my remarks was maybe share a little bit with everyone in the room about what we hear from our members the folks that we, we keep talking about that are doing all this saving and retiring and <laughs> or not saving as the case may be and not retiring securely um, and and so in that context I want to pull back a little um, because what we hear from our members is Obviously, as you might well imagine, they don't typically call us up and say, I have a problem with portability. That's, that's not, that's not, some do, you, you would, as you well imagine, I have, I have many folks who uh, manage plans who are retired and call us up and some of them serve on our board and, and uh, but most, that's not what they're gonna call about. Uh, that's not what they're gonna come to an event or, or respond to us uh, if we're surveying them and say that that's their number one problem. Uh, so what we do hear a lot from our membership uh, and from other older Americans through the surveys that we do is that there is a bigger picture, a bigger context in which this savings conversation is happening. And when we talk about regaining momentum, we have to talk about, um, and Lisa specifically had said to me, regaining momentum for the next decade. We need to do that in the context of where, where are we and what are the trends that we see? And what, what, are the, what, what, do, what do people face when they're trying to put together uh, retirement income? As I think Christine correctly said, that's really the frame we need to talk to people about, uh, about this, this issue. Uh, and so what we know is we've got all these economic and social trends uh, over recent decades, not, not, just, not just since 2008. Sometimes I do have folks that say to me when I do a presentation, well, a lot of what you're saying is about home values or about uh, job loss, and that's, that's recent. But, but what we're talking about is exacerbated by recent economic trends, but it is a longer term um, set of constraints that we, that we see limiting people's ability to save for their retirement income. And so what, what are some of those and what does it add up to? Um, the senators both referenced a absolutely, as they should, the current environment that we're in, which is so focused on budget politics and the, the deficit that the federal government faces. But we haven't heard anyone yet today talk about the retirement deficit. And that's something that at ARP we, uh, we are very focused on and we're very worried about. And we do hear from a lot of individual members, maybe they don't, that's not what they call it, but they talk about it in any number of ways. And the deficit that we're talking about, and I know that all of you are familiar with this figure, uh, has been put at $6.6 .6 trillion. Uh, that's the gap that the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College has, has determined is the difference between what American households between the ages of 32 and 64 should have right now if they were going to retire with adequate income, but do not. And that's, that's a lot of money. Now, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it was, I, I thought, terrific to hear the senators uh, remarks about how much more savings we have generated in, in this nation, uh, especially because of a lot of the changes that they were able to get into the law. And we were, we were very uh, uh, staunch supporters, especially of the auto, uh, uh, of the auto uh, uh, proposals. And we do believe that those can change behavior, and they clearly have. They have the data to show it. And the senators are right and proud to mention that. But we still have a very, very big uh, gap in, and that's the deficit that we're worried about in, in what households need to retire. Uh, we, uh, we know that for most Americans, Social Security is going to be their sole source of income when they do retire. 
And uh, I know that Janice is certainly going to get into a lot more of this in her remarks, uh, but it is not something that we believe is going to be less true in the future than it is today or has been for decades, uh, especially given uh, the decline in DB plans, which you know many of our members do still uh, participate in a DB plan. Uh, but Chris, Christina is, is, of course, telling you something that you already know, that, that what we have today is, a DC, is mostly a DC system. It, DB plans are not there to provide uh, the certainty that a lot of our members, our older members, had as they went through their working years. Our younger members don't have that certainty. Uh, and Lee was exactly right to mention that Gen Xers, folks in my generation, probably have the least, and, and younger workers have the least access to these plans. And I don't think, unsu unsu not a surprise that that goes hand in hand with not having a lot of confidence in your retirement income and your retirement prospects. Uh, I appreciated that the senators and, and in the hearing this week at Ways and Means, we, we heard a, a much higher percentage of participation in uh, worker, uh, workers being able to access retirement plans through their employer. But, uh, you know, we know that for decades the, the ability to participate has been pretty much at 50 percent. And this goes to, I think, uh, Jeff was certainly going to talk more about this. What do we do about the fact that tra traditionally over decades and, and over a lifetime of lost opportunities to save at work. If we don't do it at work, we just, we know we don't do it. Half, half of our workers aren't really having access to the opportunities to save. I, Christine has referenced uh, the Auto IRA, which is uh, a bill that we have uh, strongly supported. We know it's not without controversy. Uh, we, we know that um, it's been introduced for several Congresses, it's currently, uh, it's S1557 and HR 4049 have been reintroduced again. Uh, we know that David John, who was in the audience, did a terrific job at the Ways and Means Committee. They spent a lot of time talking about it, uh, highlighting why this would be a great, simple solution, really, to a lot of the issues of coverage uh, that we worry about. Uh, and we would love to see that move. If we could regain momentum and just get more folks with access to savings, that would be a big help. But it, it would still not address some of the other underlying trends that we know we hear a lot from our members. Of, uh, and, and we know that uh, they're bigger trends. They're bigger than retirement income trends. They're trends that are throughout the economy. We hear uh, from our members quite a lot about uh, and I was very happy to hear Senator Portman reference this, about jobs sh that they would love to work, that they would love to work longer, that they do feel that there are barriers to doing that. But it, it, again, it's not a question of boomers not being able to stay on the job now. It's a question of four decades we have seen uh, trends where we've got stagnant wages or we have underemployment in some sectors and in some demographics. And that, of course, constrains what people are able to put away for their retirement. Uh, we see debt. Again, I know that, that in Washington, the debt we talk about every day is the nation's debt. I know that the IMF is here in town and the World Bank are having their meetings. And the debt we're talking about is the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. And is that heating up again? But the debt that our members call us up about isn't, isn't about that. It's about the fact that they have homes underwater. It's about their credit card debt. Uh, we're starting to hear from our younger members who uh, are concerned. They are never going to shed their student loan debt. They may have co-signed loans for their kids. They may be carrying their own debt. It was a terrific piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, if it wasn't yesterday, it was the day before, <coughs> talking about the postponement of major life decisions and its relationship to student loan debt. And I can't help, as a retirement person and as someone who cares deeply about Social Security, I can't help wonder, what does it mean when you know, we've got a situation where people are postponing childbearing and other major important, from my perspective, life, but also, let's be frank, economic decisions because they're carrying student loan debt. 
So these are the kinds of things that we hear from our members. Uh, I think at AARP, we all want to see, number one, more opportunities for the 50% that have traditionally not had access to workplace savings to have that access. Uh, number two, we're very concerned about adequacy of savings. And we have, uh, uh, and even for those who do have a nice nest egg, making some poor choices, maybe they take that lump sum and maybe they, they don't do the right things with it so that those savings can last. Uh, so we're concerned about, about the coverage, we're concerned about adequacy, we're very concerned about portability. A lot of, of our older members, they were very lucky to work uh, for one or two employers. Our younger members, that of course goes without saying is that's, no one does that anymore. And while we have addressed some of those issues and the senators raised that, we still have a lot of problems that we see with rollovers. But to us, this whole, the, the, you know, and we would like to see those addressed when we, when we talk about improvements to the retirement savings menu uh, of, of um, tools that we have. But what we, what we think when we hear from our members and when we see these, these trends overall, uh, that we see emerging as the, the top issue is where is that bedrock? And I know Janice will talk about this. Where is that confidence in, in the one income stream that we know has been there for 75 years and knowing, the trustees report will come out next week, knowing that Social Security's finances are strong but will face major challenges and, are, and, will, and will, those challenges will become more and more stark as decades go on, what are we doing to ensure that Social Security remains the bedrock of re retirement income for all workers in America for current retirees and future generations of retirees? And so uh, to us, I, I think that what I want to you know, lay out is what we're hearing from our members uh, and when we step back and we take a look at the really big picture, realizing that we can always do more to improve private savings, and we should, but we are really going to have to take a hard look and ensure that Social Security and any changes that are made to Social Security are designed to have that income stream be the guaranteed income stream that it has been for 75 years, because that's, that's not replaceable. Yep. And, um, and whenever, we, whenever we talk about Social Security, we, we have to keep in mind that it may be a very large part of the federal budget, and it may be tempting to only think about it in those terms, but it, it is 90% of the personal income budget of millions upon millions of Americans, and that that really has to be the top priority when we discuss it. Thanks, Christina. Now, I know you all are worried that we will not get through our panel, and I assure you we will. We like talking about Aspen doesn't have a red light. We like going deep on conversations. So I, I do want you all to, 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 to be deep and to not hold back. Our next speaker is, uh, is Bill oh, Chetney. Uh, that, that's uh, reassuring because I thought I was going to have to be like one of the congressmen. I cede my five minutes to the gentleman from Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Anyway, uh, it was really great to, uh, to have the senators here today and, it's, uh, and to have the band back together, if you will, or the, or the dance troupe uh, team back together. Um, you know, Senator Portman's been in private practice a while now, freshly elected, and they did some tremendous work uh, a decade ago, but uh, we got the next phase to do, and it's really uh, going to be great having their leadership. Um, they hit on a couple of things that are, are near and dear to me. Um, one is financial literacy and the other is advice. And I, I really think that this is the most crucial next frontier of, of the retirement space. Um, we throw around education and advice kind of interchangeably, and there's a huge difference between them. So I want to kind of get down to the kitchen table or across the lunchroom table, if you will, and, and talk about what, what goes on and, and what is this difference between what we've relied on historically, which is education, versus what is really needed, which is advice. And many of you are, are members of, of a retirement plan of some sort, so you'll probably appreciate this. What we do currently is provide a menu. So we go out to the tens of thousands of mutual funds in the marketplace, and then we, uh, we do some exhaustive research, and we rip it up and we say, okay, here's your menu. Here's 100 choices, and then we rely on the individual to pick out something from that menu. 
Now, more sophisticated plans with consultants and advisors on them, they go another step and they actually cut it down for you. Right? <laughs> so here's 25 choices, but again, do it yourself. Now there is an alternative, which are target retirement funds, but this is a one size fits all approach that basically says if you're gonna retire in 2030, you're the same as the person over there that's 2030 and this one is 2030 and obviously, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So I have a lot of passion around the need to give real investment advice rather than investment education. But to the point of financial literacy, it's not just about getting you in the appropriate model number five rather than have you pick out your own funds or be in that 2030. That's only a part of it. And if you look at what individuals have access to that are affluent or mass affluent, there's hundreds of thousands of advisors and financial planners that are chasing their business and they'll sit down with them and talk to them about their quarter million dollars that they have invested and they don't hand them a menu and say, these are the 100 funds I like or the 20 funds I like. They say, I think now that I know you, I think that you should be in this kind of a mix of funds. And by the way, I'm going to keep looking at that on a regular basis and as it changes or if I don't like a fund or if your situation changes, I'm going to take care of you. So it's that kind of level of hand holding. Now they meet with an individual investor or retail investor on a regular basis and most of their conversations I would represent are not really, I don't think you should be in a Model 5 anymore, you should be in a Model 6. It's just conversations where they say, hey my kid's going to college in two years and do I have enough money and what should I do to save for that or my parents retired and you know they need health care and all of those other kind of life experiences that's what we need to do as far as financial literacy and I think we have a unique opportunity as a captive audience inside of a retirement plan inside of a workplace that we can come in and create modules that we do on an ongoing basis and have somebody in that lunchroom every month and this month it might be teaching your kids about money this month it might be post-retirement health benefits and by the way I've put you in a model five and if you have a question every third or fifth month I still be in Model 5 or what's happening in the investment world? These folks that don't have access and will never have access or never have those hundreds of thousands of advisors pursue them, they feel like they have their financial advisor and that person shows up in the lunchroom once a month. So as an industry, I think we have to evolve. We have to have a lot of passion around that type of an experience for employees to have that financial literacy and the advice that the centers talked about. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Aspen Institute and their staff for putting this together and inviting me and providing lunch as well. Hopefully, there will still be some left. Uh, I also want to give a, a quick plug that uh, you know we're going to be having a summit next week uh, at the National Press Club. There's flyers back there. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first summit looking specifically at Latinos and their retirement security preparedness. So I invite you all to kind of continue the, the conversation there. Uh, also, I've only been given five minutes, so I'm going to touch very briefly on a wide array of topics, but uh, I'll be around after this, so I'd love if people want to talk in, in more detail, I'd love to, to talk more. Uh, I think the, the idea of regaining momentum is, is very important and timely. Uh, while there's been a lot of momentum, you know, among industry and with DOL, I think at least uh, in the halls of Congress, um, a lot of the talk the past year has been very negative in regards to retirement security. Uh, they've been focusing on cutting Social Security benefits and uh, eliminating some of the, the pension tax incentives. And so in, in that context, I think we really need to concentrate uh, on policies that are really the most efficient and have the biggest bang for the buck uh, with a particular focus on helping those that really need it the most. Uh, Social Security is a bedrock, I, I use the word, of, uh, of our retirement security system. Uh, you know, benefits, they rise uh, with inflation, they're guaranteed for a lifetime, and they're earned. So the more you contribute, the, the higher the benefit you get. Uh, Social Security is very, very efficient. Um, but, you know, some of the, the proposals, such as means testing or, or raising the retirement age and then trying to grant waivers for people in physically demanding jobs, um, you know, they're really going to be difficult to administer and they're really going to decrease the efficiency and really decrease the value we get for, for our dollars. Um, everyone needs a basic floor. 
uh, provided by Social Security. Uh, even people who are well off today, you could ask uh, Alan Iverson for basketball fans. I'm sure uh, he probably never thought he'd need Social Security or MC Hammer, or I could go on and list celebrities all day, but uh, we should do that some other session. Um, but, uh, you know, Social Security for Latina women over the age of 65, their average benefit is under $10,000 a year. That's the average, so some are less. And more than half of them rely on Social Security for nearly all their income. Uh, for more than a quarter of all Americans, you know, the discussion on retirement security ends right there. It's all about Social Security. That's all their, their income. And for about two-thirds, it's more than half their income. Uh, you know, we've released a, a plan to make Social Security fully solvent <clears throat> without cutting benefits. And I know Lisa and <clears throat> some others uh, uh, were part of a commission of experts of color. They released a plan. I'm sure Tom and Janice could, you know, give them a back of an envelope. They could probably come up with five different ways to make Social Security fully, fully solvent. Um, one area I do want to talk about, just because I, I feel it hasn't gotten a lot of attention, is really what to do with the, the trust fund. Uh, it's currently at 2.6 trillion, and it's going to grow over the next dozen years or so to close to four trillion dollars. Uh, at which point, over the next 15 years, that entire four trillion will be drawn down if, if nothing's done. Um, you know, I, I think we really need to diversify the trust fund while it's still increasing, um, and we're in fact uh, going to be releasing a, a plan later this summer. Uh, to strengthen the lockbox, to strengthen that trust fund by diversifying in, in local and state infrastructure. So that's something uh, to look out for. Uh, on our, the pension side, um, our system used to be focused on defined benefit pension plans, uh, which worked very well for working class Americans. But of course, these have been in, on the decline in the private sector and uh, under a lot of attack in the, the public sector as well. Um, today, defined contributions really kind of dominate our private retirement security. Um, you know, we, it's expensive. We forego about $80 billion in revenues, and I know there's, there's different figures uh, depending on how you calculate it, um, but to promote 401k and defined contribution plans. And, um, you know, we've made a lot of gains in the system, uh, certainly auto enrollment, auto escalation, uh, some of the target date investment funds have, have really made the 401k system work a lot better. And so I, I, I want to recognize that. But at the same time, you know, while it's worked for a lot of workers, especially the tax incentives for higher income workers and those who have it, um, frankly, it's, it's failed for many Americans. Uh, I think we, we've discussed that nearly half of Americans lack access to a pension plan. And for Latinos, the community I'm, uh, our coalition represents, less than one-third have access to a pension system uh, through their employer. So I, I think we can do better, and I, I think we need um, to do better. Uh, and I really see there kind of being three potential solutions uh, to this problem. I mean, first, there are a lot of proposals out there to expand Social Security or to allow people to buy a a stake in an expanded Social Security. Uh, I think there's a lot of benefits to this approach, but in the current political environment, you know, there's a lot of work that will need to be done, and the political winds will, will definitely have to shift. So I'm not, I'm not sure how, how feasible that is. Um, a second solution, uh, which our coalition has strongly endorsed and which has been talked a lot about, is the auto IRA proposal. Uh, this would give access to not everyone, uh, but, but millions of Americans, who, especially low-income workers, um, it would give them access to the positive aspects of our 401k system. It would take advantage of the power of the default. Uh, it would, with the expanded tax savers credit, it would give them an incentive. It would give them a match to participate. It would help small businesses who want to offer a plan to their employees. Uh, you know, we also think the Lifetime Income Disclosure Act, uh, you know, wouldn't cost us barely anything. It would be pretty much no cost. And I, I found the 4% figure very interesting. I'd love to, to talk more about that. But, um, you know, it would clearly increase savings for people. Um, so we think that'll really kind of target and help those people that, that need it most and give us a most efficiency for our dollar. Uh, in contrast, there are proposals to increase the tax, uh, I'm sorry, the cap uh, for contributions. 
um, you know, this could be a good idea to increase savings, but in this budget environment, I don't think we should be focusing on people who are already saving $17,000 a year. Uh, so we have some concerns about using our, our dollars uh, to the most efficiency. And then finally, you know, if Congress doesn't, uh, you know, pass the IRA or, or come up with a solution, I think a third possibility which we're seeing is that states are going to start taking matters in their own hand and start experimenting with solutions. Uh, we've seen that with California State Senator De Leon introducing legislation, which uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll, I'll uh, use some technical nuance and say would, would allow you to buy into a CalPERS-like system, uh, which is a very simplistic version. Uh, you know, I also saw the New York uh, Comptroller write an op-ed about a week or two ago uh, about advocating for New York uh, for a proposal that Teresa uh, Ghilarducci introduced. Um, and so, you know, going by state by state has some benefits in that you could experiment, uh, but I think there's also a lot of disadvantages with economies of scale, disadvantages with portability when people move from one state to, to another. And so I think, you know, our preference would be a national solution based on the auto IRA, but, um, you know, if Congress can't act, I think the, the future you're going to see much, uh, states really taking this on more and more on their own. Thank Jeff, you. thank you, and uh, I want Karen to come up, and I want to thank uh, Jeff for your remarks. Both Jeff and Bill really situated us in Main Street and uh, in our largest growing minority population. I want to hope we'll come back to both of those things. But Karen, in many ways, TIA CREF was the pioneer in thinking about retirement savings. So I want to welcome you and brief remarks. Yes, I'll be brief, and I think a lot of the comments I was going to make have been covered to some extent. So thank you, Lisa Mensa and the Institute for, for holding this briefing. We're very uh, excited to be part of it. And um, to Fred and Ginger, a.k.a. <laughs> Senator Portman <laughs> and Cardin, for all of the leadership, courage, and continuous concern about retirement issues. We have a pretty unique perspective on it, being in the business since 1918. And uh, we've got, you know, we've got like 500 billion in uh, retirement assets under management. So we've got, we cover about 15,000 institutions throughout the country. So, and we've been doing well by our participants for, for all, the, all that time. Um, that said, and I won't uh, sort of set the table with the statistics and the underlying factors leading to where we are, because I think that's been really laid out by our panelists. Uh, what I did want to say is um, what our sort of main observation is, everything's shifting to the individual. Uh, more and more of the burden of retirement is shifting to the individual. 401ks are the main you know, vehicle for retirement savings now, but they weren't ever created for that purpose. They were created to supplement Social Security or other pension plans in the private and public sectors. They're not, it's a not an adequate framework. Um, there's ample evidence, and I won't get into the statistics, but we know many eligible workers don't participate. Many employees and employers don't contribute enough. Many employees don't implement an, an appropriate asset allocation strategy. And finally, many fail to preserve assets for retirement. So they're dipping in. They're taking out loans and liquidating for living expenses. So we are really headed to a major crisis. And for many, it's already a crisis for them individually. So we're, man we're not managing longevity, as uh, Christine Marx has already uh, certainly given you a lot of uh, perspective on. But it's a 20 to 30 year proposition for most of us after we retire, if we're lucky enough, given the health trends. And we're not prepared. Um, another, uh, so that leaves Americans with a very complex <coughs> set of uh, decisions to make about retirement and primarily they're on their own. So uh, we know that uh, they're not prepared and we have a pretty, what we consider intelligent core base of, cons of participants for the company. We are, uh, we serve the nonprofit world and our core participant base is professors, 
um, researchers, hospitals, et cetera. So pretty intelligent. We like to say brilliant because they're our customers. Well, we, the TI Cref Institute, which um, did a study with many of our participants over the age of 50, and we said uh, to them, uh, we want to sort of test your financial literacy. And these are professionals. This is not kids in school. And we had, we had them answer questions on interest rates, effects of inflation, and the concept of risk diversification. These were pretty basic questions. Only a third of the respondents got those questions right. So that just gives you a sense of the lack of financial literacy and the need for more education and advice, as you, Bill, had mentioned so eloquently. I mean, education and advice are a critical piece of what is missing from the current sort of retirement strategy in this country. And uh, when we um, look at that, we conclude that in the face of all these challenges, T.A. Cref has been making the case that our nation needs to rethink, repair, and restart our national dialogue on retirement in the 21st century and continue the great work that Senators Portman and Senators Cardin have uh, already begun, but it really needs to be expanded upon. So what would a plan that we, uh, in terms of retirement policy, shape? Uh, it would continue to recognize that helping employees achieve financial security is a shared responsibility of both the employer and the employee. It would provide income that lasts a lifetime throughout perhaps 20 to 30 years of retirement. It would help retirees meet uninsured health care expenses. That's the other looming issue that we're not even touching on yet, but it is really going to be a tsunami. It would recognize that a one-size-fits-all solution doesn't work in such a diverse society. It would be sustainable even as the 80 million baby boomers who are headed towards retirement are increasingly putting pressure on the current system. It would also include strong education and advice components, as Bill mentioned, so we're totally on the same page with that. Recognizing that most people need help in making decisions about re achieving retirement security. There are basic core elements that we at TI Craft believe are essential on an individual basis. So I'll touch upon them for a minute here because I don't think we've been talking specifically about the individual so much on this panel, though it, it is important to factor into public policy making. Uh, we believe that the savings should be at least 10 to 15 percent of their income per year. This is once you're in the workforce. We believe that you need a long-term stra saving strategy based on your personal goals, your appetite for risk, and your situation. Situations change and the personal uh, long-term strategy needs to be tweaked as situations change. Um, diversification is key to shelter you from some of and weather some of the you know, economic crisis that we're facing and the ebbs and flows. And it's important that a, a portfolio checkup be done at least annually because of the ebbs and flows and making sure your situation is still on the right path. Um, these principles are straightforward, but we know there's a lot of complex decision making in employing those on an individual basis and articulating a savings strategy, even among those of us in the, insure, the uh, financial services industry, can be tough. I certainly know on my behalf, I can tell you, I can't do it by myself. Uh, too often people just either pick funds that seem to have you know, a high value for the last year, five years or so, or they consult their relative or friend and sometimes become paralyzed about making decisions and therefore are behind the eight ball every day that they don't take action. So because the bottom line here is ultimately personal responsibility um, that most of us are going to be taking on, uh, we really believe that the tax incentives to help incentivize that personal responsibility is really going to be an important part of any policy, underlying policy that we move towards. 
Um, so just to conclude, the demographic uh, shifts and the recession have really put a spotlight on these issues in building a financial, a sound financial security future. Uh, today, individuals bear most of the responsibility for assuming they can achieve it. And we believe widespread financial literacy in our country makes that particularly challenging as a goal we need to meet. Given the new realities in our 21st century uh, challenges, uh, we look forward to working and helping shape um, the new retirement policy uh, debate that, that is ensuing. Thanks, so thanks Karen, for your comments. very much. And I like your words. I'm going to borrow them for our next event, Rethink, Repair, Restart. <laughs> right. Clearly, thank you, Janice, for, thank you, first of all, let's acknowledge Karen. All right, our anchor runner here. Thank you, Janice. You have to explain bedrock. So I have to explain bedrock. Uh, you'll, you've been more than patient, and um, I will be very quick. And uh, just first uh, acknowledge that it, it, it really was exciting to have Portman and Cardin back together. I mean, it, that kind of gets my juices going. Uh, my assignment is to speak about the bedrock of retirement savings for Americans, which is Social Security. To do that, I'm going to make a series of very short points. First, Social Security is the largest source of income for all groups age 65 and older, except those in the top one-fifth, and there's copies of this over there. The top one-fifth is down here, and the reason it's not the biggest there is they're working. The green thing is working, the red thing is Social Security. Second, high paid under Social Security is vastly different from high paid under the tax code. By example, the Simpson-Bowles proposed benefit reductions generally thought to affect only higher wage earners. In fact, reduce benefits for individuals with average earnings of $37,000 a year. Keep that in mind as we go forward. High paid tax is not high paid Social Security. Third, a bit of history. The primary goal of the 1983 amendments and the Greenspan Commission was to get through the 1980s, to get to 1990 when contributions would rise in steps from 5.4 to 6.2 percent of covered payroll, a rate actually set back in the 70s. That left the long term still uh, loose, and in order to make a down payment on that, Pickle, uh, Jake Pickle and Dan Rostenkowski spearheaded the amendment to raise the age of normal retirement. This was a benefit cut of over 13 percent. The goal, their goal, was to have it affect no one over age 40 in 1983, and we came pretty close to that. It came out to about 30, 43, 44. The thinking was, and I do see the irony, the thinking was, do the benefit cut now because that needs a lot of lead time and we can raise taxes later when we know exactly what we will need. Fourth, where are we now? Since 1983, through repeated surpluses of revenue over expenditures, the Social Security has a trust fund of over two and a half trillion. Obviously, Social Security did not cause the present deficits that we face in the general fund. Assuming continued economic recovery, the Social Security fund will actually continue to grow and resume its growth for about another decade. Then down the road, it's expected to use the reserves it has to, uh, that it has built up to pay benefits, which means that it will use the interest income on the bonds that it holds and eventually could cash in some or even all of its bonds. Payments on those bonds come from the general fund, as they deal on any other bond issued by the government. The important thing here is to remember that these particular bonds were bought by the payroll taxes levied on American working families. So our obligations here are especially strong. And in terms of today's discussion, these bonds are the most widespread retirement investment owned by American workers. Fifth, in looking at Social Security long term, a couple of facts are important. 
Adding all its provisions together, the 83 amendments actually reduced benefits long term by close to 20 percent. So we've already done a big thing long term. After the bump up for the boomers, the long term cost of Social Security levels off at, say, percent of GDP, at about 6 percent. It does not keep escalating. This is not health care we're talking about here. Social Security goes up and then flat. And Social Security is 100 percent solvent for the next quarter century, 90 percent solvent for 50 years, and about that healthy beyond that. So sixth, perhaps we should begin to discuss what size trust fund we should maintain. We probably do not want to draw it down as we did in the early 1980s, having lived through that. I do not recommend it. <laughs> having already enacted long-term cuts, perhaps it is time to think in terms of gradual contribution increases. A, it's a path that receives surprisingly strong support across all age co cohorts and across party lines, Republican, Independent, and Democratic, and in, a, in opinion poll after opinion poll after opinion poll. If we did that, we would ensure Social Security for the future, and we'd have a favorable s side effect on our general fund as well, not to mention on savings and retirement for future generations. Thanks. All right, we are at our time. Uh, what you should have in an Aspen event is you should have a wonderful moderated dialogue that dives in and teases out questions. Come back, we will get to that. <laughs> Today, uh, it's my job to just say thank you again to our panelists. You were all gave us not only your one words, but a real deep sense of where your passion is for regaining momentum. I also think there's a false choice often in Washington that we have to pick between a private retirement system and a, and a public social security system. And we insisted at this event on talking about them both. Uh, we're ignoring committee structures and focusing on really what it will take uh, to regain momentum. And I want to thank all of you for, you know, honestly uh, putting in front of us uh, what is here, because we do want a system that does both things and gives us real retirement income uh, for our future. So to all of you, thank you very much for today, and uh, again to our panel, thank you.